Um, just to recap uh, from the last update um, on what we see as a typical FRTB end-to-end, -end, we have market data coming in as the start of the process. Market data builds up to time series. That time series is used to generate full revaluations. Those full revaluations become P&L vectors. The P&L vectors are used in turn to calculate expected shortfall for IMA capital. Uh, if a bank doesn't uh, want to use or go for IMA approval, then market data isn't needed. You, you need the bank's risk positions and you've got to apply risk weights and risk calculations, uh, apply the correlations to calculate capital under the standardised approach. The two things I'd like to focus on today in terms of kind of an update on you know, where we are with F4TB and what issues have, you know, at least we're seeing, are prominent in our discussions with, with banks are non-modelable risk factors and the cleansing of that historical time series and how important that's going to be from um, an IMA compliance perspective. Uh, for focus on non-modelable risk factors, uh, as you know, uh, a bank for a, a risk factor to be used in IMA calculations, that risk factor has to be deemed modelable. So the instrument has to have a sufficient amount of real trades, um, which are actual executed trades or committed quotes for that to happen. There are three things that we're seeing are very important for that, uh, and even more so of late. I think the industry is focused purely on, um, or not purely, but you know, largely on the use of the modelable risk factors in calculations. But there, I think there are really key data aspects there to this. Um, those real price sources can come from multiple places. They can come from vendors, they can come from the bank's own trades, they can come from other kind of related platforms. You know, the ability to identify a single instrument uh, and have instrument lineage for non modelable risk factors is going to be key. Um, so that single instrument identifier, tying it to those multiple sources, identifying duplicates across those sources is a, is a real key data issue that is going to be, I think, is, is crucial for uh, to have a, a true non modelable risk factor solution. Um, and it's not one that we're necessarily seeing that's prominent in banks thinking. They're really more focused on the calculations that those uh, risk factor modelability discussions are driving. Um, I think the other key point for non modelable risk factors that we're seeing is how you link uh, banks internal positions to the external observable price data uh, that the modability will be determined uh, on. Uh, so you, uh, two examples are uh, a yield curve and a volatility surface. I don't want to get too kind of specific on this, but I think they're two you know, pretty good examples. Um, for a yield curve, uh, you've got the external data. These are the swap points that are uh, provided by or the deposits or the futures that come from other exchanges or from brokers they're the observable points but a bank won't typically risk manage to those observable points it needs to convert that yield curve into a set of smoothed call them internal risk factors it's just a name that we've used that's really the the discount factors and the zero coupon rates that are derived from that yield curve as part of a bootstrapping process. You need a solution to link those derived points to the external points. The external points will be used to determine risk factor modelability, yet it's the internal smoothed points that are used to risk manage the bank's positions. And we've got a quite a nice solution that allows you to do that linkage, determine the modelability based on the external points and to allow a bank to still maintain its internal smoothed derived risk factors to do its risk management. A similar thing applies for a volatility surface. A smoothed surface, uh, if you take a Sabre volatility surface, a bank will uh, calibrate its Sabre parameters, uh, derive a smoothed surface, yet it's still the external observable points on the volatility surface that you've got to determine modelability for. Uh, so that ability to determine modelability on the one side, link it to a bank's uh, smoother derived internal risk factors will be key to any of these solutions.
Um, the time series piece uh, is probably even more challenging from a data perspective than the non-modelable risk factor piece. Non-modelable risk factors are uh, prominent. They're you know, front and center in you know, industry discussions because the industry just hasn't really tackled that challenge before. Uh, time series has been around <clears throat> as long as VAR has been around, as long as market risk has been around as a, a concept. Um, I guess what's changed is the amount of it you need to, to validate. Uh, that 2007 date is, uh, is not going to change. Um, it's as time moves on, because the crisis happened in 2008, that's typically the stress period in a lot of banks' calculations, uh, 2007 will, will stay as it is. And time moves by, you've got to do you know, more and more data cleansing of time series. Uh, the volume of data that you need to, to cleanse is going to become greater over time. And you need you know, pretty robust methods to cleanse that. Now, a bank might have, for example, several hundred, hundred thousand instruments across its curves, its volatility services, its cash instruments required for cleansing. Uh, you need methods uh, like gap filling, like interpolation, proxying to cleanse that. And you need to be able to do that in an incredibly um, performant way and in a, in a relatively short window at the end of every day. You don't have to clean all of it every day, but you know, for scenario calculation purposes and for other reasons, you've got to be able to clean that uh, you know, on a daily basis or a lot of that on a daily basis um, very, very quickly and accurately so that the time series can be passed to the risk calculation engine for IMA calculators.